This is the third video in the series on calcium and phosphate disorders, and the topic is hypocalcemia. The primary physical manifestations of hypocalcemia are various forms of tetany, which itself is the repetitive discharge of peripheral nerves after a st single stimulus. Symptoms related to tetany include perioral paresthesias, muscle stiffness, spasms, and cramps, shortness of breath due to spasms of the diaphragm, and diaphoresis. There are two distinctive physical signs of hypocalcemia which are interesting, but which I find to be less than practical at the bedside. The first is Chofstek's sign, which is facial spasm elicited by tapping on the ipsilateral facial nerve anterior to the ear. Unfortunately, it's estimated that up to 10% of normal subjects have this sign, which greatly diminishes its positive predictive value. The second is Trousseau's sign. This is carpal pedal spasm induced by inflation of a blood pressure cuff above systolic blood pressure for three minutes. As you can see from the picture here, it includes adduction of the thumb, flexion of the metacarpal phalangeal joints, extension of the interphalangeal joints, and flexion of the wrist. The reason this sign is not practical is that it's very uncomfortable to have the cuff inflated that high for very long, and most patients won't be pleased about it. The more severe symptoms of hypocalcemia include seizures, hypotension, emotional lability, and psychosis. The likelihood that any of these develop is related to both the degree of hypocalcemia and how quickly it developed. As with hypercalcemia, there is an interesting EKG finding. If you recall from the last video, hypercalcemia was associated with an unusually short QT interval. As you might be able to guess, hypocalcemia is associated with an unusually long QT interval. Here's an example. Of note, while there are many causes of a long QT interval, hypocalcemia is the only one that I know of that typically does not simultaneously cause prolongation of the T wave itself. In other words, the reason the QT is prolonged is because of prolongation of the ST segment. In other forms of long QT syndrome, for example, in congenital uh, prolongation of the QT or in drug-induced and in hypokalemia, the T wave is also stretched out. Here's a particularly striking example of this phenomenon. In this case, an 80-year-old woman presented with dyspnea, palpitations, weakness, and muscle cramps. She was status post-thyroidectomy, presumably with damage or inadvertent removal of all or some of her parathyroid glands as well. Her corrected serum calcium was 4.8 milligrams per deciliter on admission. I move on to the etiologies. This diagram will look familiar by now. And as with hypercalcemia, it will help us to understand the three major mechanistic categories of hypocalcemia etiologies. First, a patient could have low dietary intake of calcium. Second, as calcitriol stimulates calcium absorption from the gut, calcium reabsorption in the renal tubules, and bone resorption, vitamin D deficiency could also lead to hypocalcemia. Finally, as PTH has similar net consequence as calcitriol when it comes specifically to calcium homeostasis, PTH deficiency also leads to hypocalcemia as well. Let's take a look at the list of etiologies in slightly more detail, starting with hypoparathyroidism. Overall, the most common cause of hypocalcemia, at least in the U.S., is patients who have sustained damage to or accidental removal of the parathyroids as a consequence of surgical thyroidectomy or other neck surgery. For similar reasons, receiving radioactive iodine therapy for Graves' disease or thyroid cancer can lead to the same. Autoimmune hypoparathyroidism may be isolated or rarely occur as part of polyglandular autoimmune failure type 1, along with adrenal insufficiency and chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Infiltration of the parathyroids has been described in hemochromatosis and metastatic cancer. Hypomagnesemia can lead to both decreased PTH secretion as well as PTH resistance, but this does not usually occur until the magnesium drops below 1 mg per deciliter. This severity of hypomagnesemia is most commonly encountered in alcoholics and in patients receiving cisplatin chemotherapy. Congenital hypoparathyroidism can be caused by various genetic defects, or complex congenital syndromes such as the George syndrome. 
PTH resistance, sometimes called pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, includes a heterogeneous collection of disorders characterized by end-organ resistance to PTH. In the next general category of vitamin D deficiency, we can subdivide this further based upon the stage in which the problem with vitamin D metabolism lies. Here is the overview of vitamin D metabolism that we originally encountered in the first video on normal physiology. There are two very general steps I did not include the first time around, which are relevant now. Calcitriol, that is the active form of vitamin D, needs to act on peripheral tissues, and the cytochrome P450 system is responsible for inactivating calcitriol. So starting early and moving late, the major mechanisms by which vitamin D can become deficient include inadequate sunlight exposure, only a relatively short duration of sun exposure to a modest amount of skin is necessary to provide adequate vitamin D3 for normal individuals. One can have inadequate dietary sources or suffer from malabsorption. Although it would seem that since sun and diet provide parallel ways to generate calcidiol, both of these etiologies must be concurrently present in order to generate clinically relevant vitamin D deficiency. However, empiric evidence suggests that overt deficiencies of both pathways are not necessarily required, even in otherwise normal individuals. Further along the pathway, one can experience inadequate function of vitamin D1-alpha hydroxylase. As this enzyme is located primarily in the kidney, chronic kidney disease is the most common explanation for this problem. Hyperphosphatemia can also inhibit its function. The diagram also demonstrates that low PTH may additionally contribute to hypocalcemia by leading to low calcitriol. Although it would seem that excessive levels of FGF23 could lead to hypocalcemia via vitamin D deficiency, excessive FGF23 typically has a more profound effect on phosphate metabolism than calcium. An inactivating genetic defect in the gene that encodes 1-alpha hydroxylase leads to the clinical syndrome of vitamin D-dependent rickets type 1. The next step is calcitriol's action on target tissues. A variety of exceptionally rare genetic defects in the vitamin D receptor leads to physiologic calcitriol resistance and the clinical syndrome of vitamin D resistant rickets, which confusingly had previously been known as vitamin D dependent rickets type 2. The final step is inactivation of vitamin D. The rate of this can be accelerated by induction of parts of the P450 system best described with phenytoin and carbamazepine. These drugs also induce direct breakdown of calcidiol. You may have noticed that I seem to have skipped over the 25-hydroxylase step. As this step is confined to the liver, it would seem likely that liver failure would contribute to vitamin D deficiency here. But clinically relevant vitamin D deficiency as a consequence of this specific mechanism, even in profound liver failure, is rarely if ever encountered. Returning to our chart as another mechanism, there is also low dietary intake of calcium. Not much more to say about that. Finally, there are a large number of miscellaneous mechanisms, which may be collectively difficult to remember, although individually are interesting. First are osteoblastic bone metastases, where a cancer, usually prostate, causes excessive bone mineralization at the sites of skeletal metastases. In severe pancreatitis, calcium soaps can be deposited in retroperitoneal fat. Hungry bone syndrome is a consequence of rapid bone mineralization following parathyroidectomy for hyperparathyroidism. Following multiple transfusions, citrate used as an anticoagulant in blood products chelates calcium in the serum, dropping levels of the active ionized form without affecting total calcium levels. The elevated pH seen in acute respiratory alkalosis causes more calcium to become bound to albumin, also dropping ionized calcium. Hyperphosphatemia, in addition to contributing to decreased conversion of calcidiol to calcitriol, can also lead to excessive extravascular calcium deposition, most of which is in bone, but which can also occur in extraskeletal tissue as well. Secondary hypocalcemia is a very common complication of hyperphosphatemia. Finally, excessive use of bisphosphonates can also lead to hypocalcemia.
This class of medication was discussed in the last lecture on hypercalcemia. Hopefully you're still with me. I know that list of etiologies was a bit exhaustive. Before moving on to discuss the diagnostic evaluation of hypocalcemia, I'm going to talk just for a minute about the diagnosis of secondary hyperparathyroidism. This is a condition seen almost solely in chronic kidney disease and is a consequence of two closely linked metabolic derangements, decreased production of calcitriol and increased serum phosphate. Having low calcitriol results in decreased renal tubular reabsorption of calcium, decreased GI absorption of calcium, and decreased bone resorption. Another effect of low calcitriol is that it decreases phosphate absorption in the GI tract and kidneys, which partially but not completely mitigates the hyperphosphatemia from the renal failure. This excess phosphate then complexes with calcium, and together these four pathologic processes result in low ionized serum calcium, which then leads to an increase in PTH secretion. This elevated PTH secretion that is caused by low calcium, seen almost exclusively in chronic kidney disease, is what is known as secondary hyperparathyroidism. In addition, the combination of low calcitriol, elevated phosphate, low calcium, and elevated PTH constitutes the entity chronic kidney disease, mineral, and bone disorder, which includes a variety of related bone abnormalities collectively referred to as renal osteodystrophy, along with extraosseous calcifications in joints, blood vessels, various organs, and subcutaneous tissues. In a minority of patients with secondary hyperparathyroidism, sustained oversecretion of PTH leads to hyperfunctioning of the parathyroid glands to the point that they are no longer responsive to calcium levels. At this point, hypercalcemia may develop and high PTH levels can persist after renal transplant would seem to correct the underlying metabolic derangements. This condition in which the parathyroids become non-responsive to calcium and continue to oversecrete PTH is known as tertiary hyperparathyroidism and it's a rare cause of hypercalcemia that was mentioned in the last lecture. So how do we diagnose the etiology of hypocalcemia? As with hypercalcemia, step one is to correct the serum calcium for low albumin. Step two is to measure PTH, creatinine, phosphate, magnesium, calcidiol, and calcitriol. Here is a table of the typical lab values for the various categories of etiologies. In hypoparathyroidism, PTH is low, phosphate high, magnesium typically normal, calcidiol normal, calcitriol normal or slightly low, and creatinine normal. In hypomagnesemia, the only derangement is typically low magnesium, though low PTH can also be seen. In the rare category of PTH resistance, PTH is high, as is phosphate. Everything else is typically normal. In calcitriol deficiency, PTH is elevated, phosphate normal or low, magnesium normal, calcidiol low, with calcitriol variable, and creatinine normal. Finally, in chronic kidney disease, PTH and phosphate are almost always high, mag may be high or normal, calcidiol is normal, though calcitriol is low, and creatinine, of course, is elevated. So what are our treatment options? Treating the underlying disorder as directly as possible is always important. Beyond that, there is oral calcium, IV calcium, vitamin D, and magnesium. Oral calcium is appropriate for most patients. Options include calcium carbonate and calcium citrate. Calcium carbonate is cheaper, though calcium citrate may be better absorbed, particularly in the elderly. Typical doses of calcium carbonate are 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams of elemental calcium daily in divided doses. IV calcium should be reserved for patients with severe symptoms, prolonged QT interval, and suspected abrupt decrease from normal to under 7.5 milligrams per deciliter, given their high risk of developing symptoms. Options for IV calcium inc include calcium gluconate, which is usually preferred, and calcium chloride. And although it's common to give IV calcium as a slow bolus over 10 to 20 minutes, this improves calcium levels only transiently, and initiation of a continuous infusion of calcium is 
and or initiation of calcitriol is needed for more sustained effect. In addition to calcium, concurrent treatment with vitamin D is needed when hypocalcemia is secondary to either hypoparathyroidism or vitamin D deficiency. For reference, here is our metabolic pathway for vitamin D again. Providing calcitriol directly is more expensive than providing vitamins D2 and D3, but it has a much shorter onset of action and bypasses the rate-limiting 1-alpha-hydroxylase step. Calcitriol is preferred in hypoparathyroidism and chronic kidney disease. While in situations where the use of calcitriol is not necessary, vitamin D3 is preferred over D2 on the basis of a recent meta-analysis showing that D3 was more effective than D2 in raising calcidiol levels. When it comes to the dosing of vitamin D supplementation, it's very complicated and we don't know the best strategy, which probably should vary based on the specific situation. For patients who are receiving vitamin D3, a typical dose for those with modest deficiency, that is, those people with a serum calcidiol level of about 20 to 30 nanograms per milliliter, is 600 to 800 units daily. In patients with malabsorption, uh, doses of 10,000 to 50,000 units a day may be necessary. For patients who are receiving calcitriol, optimal dosing is particularly controversial and variable it's recommended to consult with an endocrinologist or nephrologist before prescribing. A major toxicity of any form of vitamin D treatment is hypercalcemia and hypercalciuria with subsequent nephrolithiasis. Periodic measurement of urine calcium may be necessary in high-risk individuals, including those with a prior history of nephrolithiasis. Finally, in patients in whom hypomagnesemia is contributing to the hypocalcemia, a sustained increase in serum calcium will be difficult without concurrent repletion of magnesium. Standard treatment for this is IV magnesium sulfate, 1 to 2 grams at a time, with frequent monitoring of magnesium levels, particularly in patients with impaired renal function. That concludes this video on hypocalcemia. The next two videos in the series will cover hyper and hypophosphatemia.